So technology has been around for a very long time, from stone tools to agriculture to the steam engine to electricity to the computer. Two MIT scholars are arguing that we are on the verge of a second machine age. This second machine age will transform our society and our economy. Let me share with you some figures. By next year, the digital economy alone will employ 32 million more people than it did back in 2010. By 2020, the digital economy will reach $6.6 .6 trillion among the top 20 most developed nations on this planet. The amount of energy or electricity that the digital age used in 2013 was the same that it was used to light the entire planet in 1985. So surely you must be thinking, well, these trends, they've got to slow down at some point, right? Wrong. According to a recent report, by 2017, a little over half of the world population will remain offline. OK? So that's something very important, because the real threat to economic growth is the digital divide. And you will be hearing about that concept more and more as time goes by. But what is the digital age? Well, I'm going to share four characteristics with you today. The first one is that it is exponential. Exponential means that it starts really, really slow, and then it takes off, like those rockets. Okay, And because of this, the devices are becoming cheaper, smaller, more powerful. For example, if a car built in 1971 would have advanced at the same pace as computer chips, by 2015, it would reach 300,000 miles per hour. It would have a fuel economy of 2 million miles per gallon. And here's the kicker. It would cost 4 cents. <laughs> so you're seeing why. And then, of course, that leads us to our second characteristic, which is digital. Obviously, everything is being converted to 1 and zeros and qubits in the near future. So everything is being digitized for good or for bad. The internet of everything is the king of them all. It is digitizing our physical world. It consists of people, of things, of data, and processes. Vast amount of data are being generated, which leads us to the third characteristic. It has the ability to combine and recombine ideas. It will allow us to identify patterns where we did not know they existed so it is very, very powerful, this combinatorial characteristic. Now, big data is considered the oil of the 21st century, yet it has to be refined into gasoline for it to be meaningful and useful. So hello, algorithm economy. These three will lead us to the fourth characteristic, which is perhaps the most important one of them all, the power to disrupt. It is disrupting left and right Internet 1.0 brought us the web, and with it, it changed the way we access information. Internet 2.0 brought us e-commerce and social media, and with it, it changed the way we shop, it changed the way we communicate. Internet 3.0 is in a head-on collision to disrupt four of the most regulated industries in this country, healthcare, education, transportation, and finance. I don't know what the end result will be, but there will be disruption, make no mistake. OK, so what, right? That's the question I get from rural communities every time. Well, first of all, the nature of innovation is changing. You see, back in the day, you had a density of minds and a density of resources, and innovation would take place. But in reality, innovation is all about collaboration. I mean, just look at the Nobel Prizes just awarded. Other than literature, there were all teams. Well, because of holograms and IT communications, virtual collaboration can't take place. It is also leveling, well, and of course, it's much easier to start anywhere, right? I don't know what they got with garage, but <laughs> it's cool, cool. It is leveling the playing field among rural communities and urban, because that density advantage that was the advantage of urban communities are no more. They don't have to be. But the rural community needs to make that transition. There are major issues to worry about, of course. Privacy, right, big brother. Security, a recent article just pegged that the cyber industry 
cybersecurity industry will, pay, will be about $170 billion. Of course, we also have a generational conflict. We have boomers in policy positions and then millennials pushing, now the largest share of the workforce. For once, they are digital natives. They get it, they expect it. It is a quality of life for them. For boomers, they're getting there. But they're in leadership positions that can undermine. And I've seen it, they will undermine. They don't understand that broadband is beyond entertainment. We also have the problem of inequality, the gig economy, the winner-take-all economy. We're, we're being disrupted, folks. And so those issues have to be overcome, yet the main one is the digital divide. The digital divide is, all, is a divide between those that have access, can afford it, and know how to use the technology. But then you have those that cannot afford it, and cannot have access to it and do not know how to use it. It is very, very complicated situation. Let me share with you this graph. This graph shows the availability of wired broadband in the state compared to the US, okay? I'm only including wired and not wireless because of something called limited data plans. If you go over them, it'll make you cry, right? <laughs> But then on top of that, it really is like having a sports car on an eight-lane highway full of speed bumps. You're not going to get there fast. So here you can see that in the US, 85% of the population has access to 25 down and three up. 68% of the Mississippi population has access to the technology. But then we broke up Mississippi into three types of counties, metropolitan, small city, and rural. And we can see here that metropolitan counties have 82% access, 66% in small cities, and 42% in rural communities. 42% and it is 2015. But then I took it a step further and I looked at the county seat because if you're from a rural town, you will know your county seat is the metro hub, right? So we looked at the county seats and we see they're fairly decently well wired, 91% of the US, 92% in Mississippi, 96% in metropolitan counties, 89 versus 88 in rural communities, counties. But what happens to the rest of the county? What happens to those that ironically would benefit the most from this technology, yet they don't have access to it? Well, we see the trend again, 83% in the US, 57% in Mississippi, 75% in metropolitan counties, 52% in small city, and you can see that one right there, less than 30%. But how can we get communities to understand, to make this transition, especially rural communities? For that, we turn to the intelligent community concept. An intelligent community is one that, whether through crisis or foresight, has come to understand the challenges of the digital economy and has taken conscious steps to prosper in it. It consists of several indicators. Four of them are the traditional economic development we are familiar with, right? We know about advocacy and marketing. We know about innovation, sustainability, and knowledge workforce. But they added broadband connectivity and digital equality. Those are really trying to measure the digital divide, right? Because we have an accessibility side of the digital divide as well as an adoption side. So how does an intelligent community think? Well, does your community encourage broadband deployment and use? Is your community engaging digitally with your citizens? Are you incentivizing in any work telework, telehealth? Do your companies and organizations understand that there are multiple online presence strategies? These are questions that intelligent communities make. And now make no mistake, it is different from a smart community. A smart community tends to deploy the internet of things. Right? It makes things more efficient, reduces costs. An intelligent community is more proactive. It's more long-term. It is beyond being smart. So how can we get this message out? Rural communities, you know, they're, they're very defensive, some of them, but we can do it. Mississippi State Extension. We've been around for about 100 years now. We are a part of a national network of agents, of specialists. We have disseminated innovation and knowledge for these 100 years, specifically on ag, 
but still we've disseminated. So it is in our DNA to extend knowledge and change lives. And that's what we're doing. That's what we're doing because we have local agents that live in the communities that are trusted, that can help us spread the word. So how are we accomplishing this? Well, we've come up with an outreach process. We do awareness. I go out there, present all the time. Agents, they present all the time. Getting this message out there, folks, the digital agent broadband is beyond Facebook. It's beyond Netflix. It's beyond entertainment. It's going to come and disrupt you. You've got to be proactive. If you plan to catch up, chances are you will not. So we do a lot of awareness. Then, if the community wants to, they complete a checklist. 41 questions, very simple, yes, no. And it is and it's based on the community development asset-based approach, which is academic jargon. But it really means a rural community focuses on its assets, not its needs. Because many times, if you focus on your needs, you become frustrated. So we tell them, look, did you know you've got this going on already? Let's focus on these. And then we deploy extension programs and resources, which I'm going to cover shortly more about. And then finally, we can nominate them. The intelligent community is a worldwide movement. There's yet a Mississippi community to appear on their Smart 21, which is worldwide. Yes, you're competing with Toronto. Sure, we'll take them. We can, right? So, but what I tell communities is this nomination is the cherry on the cake. The actual, you know, the cherry is this nomination. You get it, awesome. But the actual cake is the community making the transition, thinking and acting digitally, which is very important. So we've been around, or this project has been around for about a year and a half. Well, more about a year. So we have reached about 1,500 people in Mississippi. We have reached 24 communities two of them international, one of them in Nebraska, the rest in Mississippi. We have come up with 25 hands-on workshops in five different communities. What do I mean with hands-on workshops? Well, let me show you this one up here was taken in Carthage, Mississippi. Boys and Girls Club, we brought in eight iPads with the Scratch Junior app, and we told them, kids, do you like cartoons? We do, we do too. Well, go ahead and make your own. Okay, so they did, but they're learning to code while they do that. Right? Pretty cool. Pretty cool. We also had a 3D printer delivered to the library in Quitman, Mississippi. It is introducing STEM concepts. It is introducing that technology to folks that more than likely would have not been introduced. And I have very high hopes that we're planting seeds. We are planting seeds. Our Wi-Fi hotspot in Louise, Mississippi. That was a very interesting story. I showed up gave a presentation about the digital age in a fire department, volunteer fire department classroom. We were there talking, and then two days later, the mayor calls me and says, Roberto, you're not going to believe this. The carrier just called me, and they said they just installed a Wi-Fi hotspot for free. I said, you're kidding, mayor. No, I'm not. Okay. Well, then the bank donated three laptops, and through volunteers, we swiped them, we loaded them with software, and then we did this computer literacy class. And I was so intrigued to see the speed. I said, Wi-Fi hotspot in Louise, Mississippi, population 300, by the way. And I ran a speed test, 150, up and down. I called the carrier, and they're like, oh, yeah, it's fiber fed. I'm like, oh, OK, <laughs> cool, awesome. Well, there you go, right? We have secured $230,000 from public and private organizations. There's a lot more to do. And then, but from the extension side, the curriculum development is really, really where I'm very interested about because we are developing very innovative programs. For example, the Master Technology Innovator. Those of you familiar with the Master Gardener, it's modeled after that one. We place volunteers in libraries and schools that help with the technology needs. The number one thing that the volunteers report to me on their forms is opening an email account, okay? But it is very, very important because those volunteers also give presentations on cybersecurity, on cyberbullying, on internet security. We also came up with one called eFront Door Program, which is in the pilot phase with, in partnership with the communications department at Mississippi State. And what we do is we send students online to search a community. They come up with a report, and then they will invite the mayor and the, and the leaders and show them what is being shown from their community. Because when I talk to them about managing 
proactively managing their online presence, they give me the, what are you talking about? I said, okay, Google your community. And don't go to the links, go to the images and see what's gonna pop up. We've seen very, very nasty thing come up. So, it's helping. It's helping communities get this digital mindset. And then finally, we have this, a curriculum for five to seven year olds where we teach them dash and dot robots. They have a couple exercises. This is when it was being tested in Starkville. You can see there, and it is pretty awesome. Pretty awesome because the kids get so excited that they go, they get to see, oh, I just told the robot to move and it moved. How cool is that? So again, we're working on it. And then finally, we created a broadband locator app. Go to connectmississippi.org and download that app. It'll tell you which broadband providers there are available based on the phone location. And I'm very proud of this one specifically because no other state has something like that. I've told the federal agency, dude, make sure you give credit to Mississippi. <laughs> because the other states, what they have is a fancy website, right? But that website, mo man, most times, it's not mobile friendly. So here you are shopping for a house and you're wondering if it has broadband. Well, you pull up the fantastic app and you check it out. So slowly but surely, we're getting there, folks. There's a lot of work to do, but we are excited and we are motivated, and I will get a Mississippi community on that list. Thank you so much.